And what else was I get? There was a candle. Do you want a candle and a picture? I think we're okay. We're okay. We're good to start. So I should just start. Okay, uh, welcome. I think so. Oh, oh, <laughs> welcome, everybody. Um, I'm so happy you've all come, and I'm extremely happy. David Hoffmeister's here, Svava is here, and uh, fresh off the week of her new release album, and, uh, uh, and y you all are here, and it fills my heart to see you here today, and uh, ah, I feel the grace of spirit with all of us, and the grace of the energy with all of us in our joining. And um, I hand it over to <laughs> the flow of the divine energy the through us all. Divine. Thank you. Thank you, Sandai. Thank you. You want to lead up with the song or two? Yeah, I can do that. <clears throat> the first song I'm going to sing is called Share Your Love. <laughs> Grace, 
trust in me will set you free love me too everything through you there is nothing for you to do
are the love of my life, the love of my life. You are the love, the love of my life. You are the love. Beautiful way to be brought in with soft. Your mic. Oh, I've got a mic. Well, that's kind of nice. It just comes out from behind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> yeah, we don't know how many people are coming today or where that they might be upstairs or downstairs, so we're ready for everything. <laughs> We've got a upstairs crew. <laughs> A little laptop, uh, so you can see on it. little laptop if, it, if it's too crowded down here, and well, everything, a camera. This is reminding me a little bit. So, Dar, do you have something well, to share? I just wanted to share that uh, if you need them, there are three bathrooms, and this one's working a bit funkily at the moment. <laughs> um, it needs to be like held down for a long time, and if there's a problem, there's a plunger. But there's another one up the stairs through um, a glass door that's better kept closed because it's two different heating systems. And then it's just to the right. Should we use the back one? To the yeah, they just the one to the right. One to the, the right. Blue one, mm -hmm. The blue one there. Okay. And um, let me see. And there's lots, there's teas and coffees and waters and <coughs> there's lots of food on the other side. And normally mm -hmm. I put it on a table, but the table is now <laughs> so, <laughs> and, 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 and so, um, welcome again. Thank you. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Sundari. Thank you. Thank you for hosting us. I don't know how many times I've come out here and been in the same room in the same situation, and Sundari is such a gracious host and opens up her house. And so, thank you. We're very honored to be here. And this is the first time that you've got a twinkly <laughs> You know, when you gave me this glass of water, it reminded me of a line from the, for some of you do the workbook lessons along with starting with the first day of the year. I think we're up to around 75. And I saw this twinkling, sparkling glass and all this sunlight and everything. And I remembered this line from the lesson this morning. It was something like, um, today we celebrate the end of your long dream of disaster. <laughs> and, uh, hey, I'll drink to that. <laughs> and so that's the perfect prop, actually, for celebrating the end to a long, he says long, dream of disaster. <laughs> it's sort of the adjective in their long. And, isn't that great that we can celebrate? Because the theme really is the light has come, that we are to celebrate. And uh, that's what the Course in Miracles has taught us, is that that um, you're just looking back, pretending really that you're you're dreaming of, of exile, when really you're at home in heaven, and you're just reviewing mentally what has already gone by. So really it's a, it's a celebration that the past is gone. And there's something lighthearted about that, because the past can seem very heavy. And it does take a lot of, we'll say, practice and devotion to hold that high light that the past is gone, to not be tainted, to not be touched by the past. Because we are to be free and innocent, and we are free in this moment. And that's uh, actually the latest book that came out, This Moment is Your Miracle. So it's a, really a rejoicing in this moment, and really giving yourself over to the moment. And in order to do that, 
it requires a development of trust. Really, your mind is is naturally trusting, although it's like what you put your trust in is really the key thing. That's why we're learning to expose and release this unconscious darkness and this unconscious guilt, because as long as we believe in the darkness, then we experience things in this world that are quite dark and can be quite extreme in terms of the intensity of the emotions. And what we really want is we want to live a, a very easy, graceful life where we're just sourced moment by moment by moment, where we're just so devoted to the present moment that we're just like carried along, like the, the old footprints in the sand story, where we just are carried along and that we're actually aware that we're carried. So we don't feel that heaviness of, of trying to figure things out, the heaviness of that personal responsibility, the heaviness of, of trying to figure things out, analyze things, try to navigate time and space, which seems really quite complex. And so we want to learn to come to live in grace. It's interesting, I think last week um, I was prompted to post this uh, article on Facebook, uh, all about Thich Nhat Hanh. Does anybody remember Thich Nhat Hanh? He's 92 now, and he's gone back to Vietnam, where he first became a monk when he was 15. And he really has gone back to his original place, where he first became a monk, to, he said, to die with grace. To really die in the demonstration of everything that he's been teaching for decades. And even though he had had a stroke a while back, and kind of like Ram Das, couldn't speak for a while and just used, you know, kind of hand motions and face motions to communicate, he he is going and using it all, even going back to this very, uh, very simple monastery and community in Vietnam. And he's saying things like, um, uh, when I die, please don't build me a stupa, you know, uh, don't, don't do anything or build anything. And, and he said, and if you must, if you absolutely must build a stupa, then I want you to put a sign on the stupa, Thich Nhat Hanh is not here. <laughs> and, uh, and, he said, and then, and actually put a second one on there too, Tick not Han uh, was never here, <laughs> and they were, they were probably laughing at that point. And he said, no, no, third one, three signs, one more sign. Tick not Han will never be here, uh, and and to me that's the essence of what we're learning is that our our life is eternal, and we have an eternal life, and it's only a dream of separation. It's just a dream that we're encapsulated in these little flesh suits. Uh, it's only a dream that, that we have a birth and a death, or even a series of births and deaths. I mean, it's, it's just a dream. And uh, it's very similar, you know, to when Ramana Maharshi uh, transcended, where he was saying, why are you crying? He said to the devotees, you know, I'm not, I'm not here. Why are you crying? Why, why do you grieve? Uh, and that's the essence. And yesterday, um, I know every time I come to California, I try to just float around wherever the Holy Spirit would have me go. And yesterday I had on my calendar lunch with Judy, Judy Sketch Whitson. And uh, I was getting invitations to come to San Jose for a salmon dinner and come for a movie gathering and everything. But something intuitively told me, don't block your day off. You're going to meet Judy. And so we left the house at 11.15 and we got back at 10.30 <laughs> at night. And that's beautiful because to me that's really, I feel, where my life is right now. It's very spontaneous and I just get these intuitive nudges like, don't, don't schedule anything. This is going to be too important. And it was beautiful too because whenever we have lunch and it's just always such a very intimate experience where we just lose track of time and space. But also, uh, 
Judy's husband, Whip, has always been very, very dear to me. And uh, yeah, I remember that time when G and I went there and we were sitting on the couch with Whit and he was telling us of his time he went to China and, and his prayer to Jesus and we were crying and yeah, <laughs> Gia had to jump off, leaf off the couch, sorry, and run to the bathroom back in the hall just because the tears were so strong. And we've had so many miracles, but we were really graced uh, yesterday because Judy was telling us too of how it came for Whit when he came to the very end of his life. It was he always was so gentle and so dignified, and he was just the the epitome of grace, um, the epitome of integrity, and uh, such a twinkle in his eye. And when it came down to he was just sitting on the, the the toilet seat already down, but just sitting on the toilet. And then she went in. She said, "And it said, is everything all right? Can I get you anything?" And he wasn't um, speaking, which he always was very articulate as well. And he would just take his finger and press it to his lips very slowly. And then, can we? Can I get you something? Can I call somebody? This and this and this soft hand wave. Just like, and this, and when finally he came out and on sitting on the bed, the same thing. It was, and and the hand wave, like, oh, it's so precious. Like this is so precious, and it, it wasn't like there was much that even preceded it or anything, um, and and it was so matter of fact, and there was there was no drama to it. And it just kind of came out of nowhere, but yet it was the presence was so strong, the grace. And even when she called for some assistance, they actually had guests that were visiting uh, them in the other room while this was going on, and then going to the hospital, this beautiful hospital room that's usually full of people and there was nobody there. It was all very still and silent in the sunshine coming through the, the window. And again, you know, it was very much just like, oh, just allow me to savor this. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a part in the Song of Prayer where Jesus says, this is what death can be. It's, it's a gentle laying aside of the body. And the way it was described, it was so exquisite, it was just so precious, and yet so simple and ordinary. There was nothing that would set it off from anything else. And to me, that is telling us that what human beings call death, which they would call the death of the body, is a non-event. It it's, Jesus teaches us throughout the Course that the ego is a belief in your mind. He doesn't ever say the ego is a belief in your body. He does call the ego a death wish, and he says that the ego is synonymous with death, that the last that you shall overcome will be death, because the last that you shall overcome will be the ego, the belief that you're separate from God. And so death is just a belief, it's not an event on the timeline when there's no more body activity, no more pulse, no more heartbeat. What the world calls death is a non-event. And of course Jesus would say the rest of the events that we call the important events and the milestones and the celebration events and everything, those are also non-events, but death is of the body is a non-event, just like all the rest of the non-events. And what he's saying is that the closest you can come to eternal life is to be in the moment, to just be present, be in the moment, be fully present, and that is your gateway to eternal life. Practicing the presence, sometimes people talk about where, where you just become so happy-go-lucky, so relaxed, so free, so joyful. Judy was actually talking about a moment where she had so much joy. She had so much joy. And she was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is, I love how this feels. And so she got out her cell phone and she called Helen Shuckman when she was in her state of joy. 
And Helen says, oh, I can't knock down, talk now, I'm taking down the song of prayer. <laughs> there they are, our two first ladies of A Course in Miracles, Helen Chuckman and Judy Scutch. One is in such a joy, joy, joy moment, and the other one, oh, can't talk now, I'm taking it. Well, here's what it's saying, and she read <laughs> some of the Song of Prayer while Judy was in this high state. And that's just a reflection. When you're in joy, you draw forth the witnesses of joy. She was drawing forth, it wasn't even published yet, but <laughs> she was getting the lines coming from Jesus in the, the Song of Prayer. How sweet. So, what we want to experience is just living in that state of grace. Grace is really, I mean, it is defined in so many ways, but you could say grace is, this, is the joyful experience that the separation never happened. Grace is the awareness that God doesn't take steps, even though the Course says God will take the final step. It does say in another place, God doesn't really take steps. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, that's just a little metaphor there, but it's, it's the state of, I need to do nothing. It's the state of, I am the Word of God. It is the state of, I am as God created me. How graceful is that? I am like my source. I was created by a loving source and I am like that source. That's grace. That's why grace doesn't have a formula. Grace doesn't have steps to it. Grace doesn't have, is not something to be figured out. And I would say grace also involves the I amness before time was. That's why it's so joyful. It's before time was. It's untainted by increments, by judgments, by all the, the weight and heaviness of time, which is an ego invention. <laughs> so ego invented time, and I amness is before time was, then that's why we we meditate. That's why we we sink inward. That's why we are still, because we're opening our hearts, opening our minds to come back to that I amness that's prior to time. Even the great um, philosopher from Germany, Immanuel Kant, he was the philosopher that finally came along and asked the question, how do we know what we know? That seems like a pretty important question <laughs> now, I'm thinking, wow, that's a lot of centuries go by, and then this uh, German philosopher, how do we know what we know? He postulated that, that there's an a priori, prior to the senses, that we, before we even come to this world, we already know everything. And what a, an amazing thing, because I thought, that's really echoing what Jesus taught uh, many centuries ago, before Abraham was, I am. A priori, prior to time. So, <clears throat> miracles collapse time. Miracles save time. You might say miracles bring the Alpha and the Omega together just to a, an experience of taking you toward what the Course calls knowledge. Truly knowing who you are. What the Greeks talked about, know thyself. It's taking you in that direction. And you will feel a sense of lightheartedness with miracles. You will also feel like uh, delightfully um, happy in the miracle because the miracle is not under conscious control. Jesus says the miracles should not be under conscious control. Miracles are involuntary. So it's almost like raining down on you. You get to a place of such surrender where you go through the day, and it's like you're just getting rained on with these experiences. And, and some of us know, with the experience of getting rained on, you can either be like uh, Gene Kelly and, I'm singing in the rain. You can really let it come and land on you and be joyful. I always remember that movie with Gene Kelly singing and out around the light post and on the street and down the street and yeah, he and Fred Astaire could really uh, light things up with joy dancing through their bodies. But imagine going through life where your day is filled with so many miracles, just cascading miracles, 
and then you feel you're being carried along. You feel there's a lightness, there's a joy, happy lightheartedness, you know. I think that's a teaching you know, from the Course. Under the Holy Spirit's teaching you will travel light and journey lightly. Soft, light, joyful. That's the way to go. So, that's what I want our afternoon to be about. We'll, we'll go till about um, around 2.30 and then we'll take a break. Every time I get here, Sundari has amazing snacks and drinks and refreshments. These are really juicy, <laughs> delicious <laughs> things that she's prepared for you with her giving heart. And we'll maybe take about a half an hour break for a bathroom breaks or stretch and, and refreshments and everything. And then we'll come back uh, around 3 o'clock and go for another hour and a half. Also, uh, as we move along today, this will be very interactive because you know, we're, there's just one of us here and the Spirit is here with us to illuminate us, to enlighten us, to bring peace to our hearts and to bring clarity. And I always love to open it up to questions, um, comments, perspectives, things that you would like to add, and so on and so forth. So it's like a, a symphony and we all get to play our parts and uh, play our music and add to the melody. So we all are swept up in this uh, same joyful melody. And for me, it's I, I go through phases in the parable of David where I can I go through some phases where I'm extremely public and traveling around a lot, and then some of the mystical phases. I do feel more of a, a an inward time, a mystical phase coming on. So I'll probably be stepping back, and even as I look ahead at 2019, I think I have another event scheduled for tonight, and then there's something scheduled for early August, August 2nd to 6th, and then there's something scheduled for October, but my calendar is not packed full as it uh, has been uh, for many years, where uh, sometimes I was just doing a number of gatherings each day and just on the move, round and around and around the world. So it feels like a time of stepping back, and, and Slava, Slava's feeling it too. She just had a, about 60 songs come through her in the last maybe year and a half, so something like that, and just recorded a, a, an album, but also is feeling kind of a real step back sense. And so for me it will be more like just I've had these periods where I'm, I'm just kind of watching the world in, in a very um, very still and detached state of mind. And it really turns, my days turn more into like open-eyed meditations, but, but there's, not, um, there's not the same quality of, as when I'm traveling and speaking and interacting. It's, a, it's, a little, it's more of a step back, restful quality, like a sinking inward feeling. And so, yeah, we're just very happy that that's rolling around. Also, um, wow, the, the Course has really turned into a movement. You know, Judy was telling us at lunch that someone was writing a book recently and they were, Judy was saying, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not really like a, a religion, it's, it's a book, and the woman said, it's a movement. It's a movement. Okay. And this movement has been rippling and rippling for decades. And um, wow, we, we could spend weeks just um, talking about and expressing all of the ripples, the way it's touched our lives and the way we've seen it touch the lives of others. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's uh, quite a miraculous and quite amazing. It's an amazing use of time and space to see things used in, with so much uh, synchronicity. It, it does seem like we just are always watching the synchronicities, the synchronicities that happen, that happen, that happen every day. And, and uh, Carl Jung talked a lot about those synchronicities and how they could become quite natural in your life if you allowed it. 
but it also your your perception of the world starts to feel a bit more surreal as you as you start to have these miracles and these synchronicities happening so frequently that you do feel you feel that lightheartedness and and you feel that celebration welling up in your own heart and you think, wow, this is what my life was meant to be, a, a celebration. It's so different from <laughs> the way that the world looks at life, because the world will see it as quite a struggle. And it has been, if we, if we would go into those memories, you know, it could be interpreted that life on earth is a struggle, but actually, you know, Jesus is really reminding us that that time is over now. This is a time of, of joyful celebration. Don't put your mind back in those memories. It's safe to let those memories go, because those memories don't come from your Creator. Those were part of a, of a holding on, defending against the light, and that's why you have to let them go. So we build up our confidence, we build up our momentum to, to move full into that joy, to really have a full expression and extension of that love and light and joy. For me, it's always been too about the, just the practical application. And even though I studied the Course for years and, and really honed in like a laser beam on the metaphysics so that I would get really get the essence of what the message was, the essence of the principle of miracles, then it was more of a, of a giving over and saying, now show me, let's, let's put this into action so that there's like a transfer of training, so it becomes consistent, and not a miracle here or there, but a consistent miracle, a, a, a bubbling, like a fountain bubbling up, and not a, a drop of rain every once in a while, uh, on, on a dry and thirsty <laughs> desert, but actually a fountain. Show me the fountain. <laughs> Show me the bubbling fountain. And that really has been very important to me to go into that. Uh, it's been beautiful too because uh, along with practicing the Course, a lot of gifts have come, fruits from the Spirit about using music. Um, there's been just like with Slava's album, there's been so many um, songs that have come through from so many friends, and so there's lots of albums, it's like a whole tradition of albums coming of this inspired music. And also the use of movies and um, television shows. Has, has anybody seen or familiar with the, the series God Friended Me? Yes! Yeah, I love it. Yeah, we're just like wooing and awing, waiting for the next episode of God Friended Me. Because there's so much collaboration, and there's so much openness, and there's so much willingness to listen and follow what's given in the moment. And uh, I love that, because uh, years ago when I visited Wit and Judy, they were telling me, they were all excited about Joan of Arcadia. They were saying that was another show that was on. They were excited, and so I mentioned uh, God friended me the tale. She said, "Oh, I got all the episodes. <laughs> we're just on <laughs> these things that are coming. CBS, I think it's on CBS. Years ago, we used to watch Roma Downey and Touched by an Angel. Uh, so I'm like, okay, CBS, come through again now with another one. It's been a while since." Del Reese and Roma Downey and Touched by an Angel, but we like it on the network TV to see these miracles reflected. A new way of looking at the world, a new way of living where not everything is planned out or contrived or controlled, but just it opens up like a flower when you, when you come to it. It just opens up and then the next flower opens and the next. And you're carried from one experience to the next to the next. And most of us have had that experience where, where things start to open up for us in unanticipated ways. It's just, it's very spontaneous and, and it's very, we're very welcoming with it, like, wow, that's it, go ahead Spirit, take my breath away, crack my mind wide open, you know, just keep leading me, keep showing the way. So, 
those are some of the joys, those are the little joys we've been experiencing, the, the God Friend in Me <laughs> episodes. <laughs> and then we even got to a point where we, we had seen like, um, was it 14 of them? And then we noticed we got from Mexico, we got up to Utah, we noticed, look, there's another episode. <laughs> but we went to try to get into it, we couldn't get into it. They said, no, no, you have to subscribe. Oh, yeah. We're like, okay. And then it says subscribe, or like, whatever, 9.99 or 5 dollars with commercials or whatever. We said, let's go for the commercial. So, <laughs> we were watching God Friend and Me, and we're like, we're going through and all the episodes, and then the commercials come on, and so I was like, oh, it's like getting hit <laughs> after years without commercials. It's like, what is this? I said, no, it's a great opportunity. It's all the same. Everything's the same. I said, there was years ago, back in the late 1990s, um, I was living in a little house I call the Peace House in Cincinnati, and, and my friend, uh, Kathy Martin was there with me, and we had cats and everything, and and we were so involved with sharing the course all over the world and doing so many projects and everything. But we we did give our we would say to the spirit, "Do you want us to turn the TV on?" And occasionally, we'd be given a movie to watch, but we were only given one TV show per week to watch. It was on Monday nights. Ali McBeal. We were given oh, Ali McBeal for one, and we were allowed to turn the volume down during the, the commercials, because of hair and body and perfume and <laughs> exercise, and it was body, body, we were like hit with all the, in the middle of the, uh, the episodes, you know, we were hit with all the commercials, but Jesus said, it's okay, just do open-eyed meditation, with the commercials, and we would see all the body images flashing at us. <laughs> Keep your eyes open, Kathy. Okay. <laughs> you know, we're practicing the course <laughs> and handling it. But Alan would be all that's like one show a week, you know, is what we could handle. But you start to realize you you're trying to transfer the training. You you're not trying to push anything of the five senses away. You're just learning to pray and, and say, Holy Spirit, let me see this with you. Let me not be tempted into upset or anger or frustration or boredom. You know, it's the practical application and you still have to follow the guidance. You know, maybe you can only handle a couple spoonfuls of stimulation here and there and, and that's given as well by the Spirit, like to say, let's transfer this, let's, let's make this year different by making it all the same. Let's, let's really trust that there's a new way of looking at the world and let's be willing to be carried there and led there and shown how to see that. And so, that, that is the, the pathway. And, and I do find, in terms of guidance, that it does get to that point where things just start to drop in everything drops in. Even the things in this world that that you go, yeah, I wish it would drop in, like like houses and cars and different things like that. Oh, yeah. How are you doing with that house idea? Oh, it just dropped in. Yeah, just dropped in yesterday, you know. Like, it actually gets more and more like that when you're so detached from everything, you're so willing to let everything be used and welcome everything that some of the things that seem like they take a long time, or they're tied in with a lot of time and energy and effort and money, even those things, uh, almost like they get slotted into the dreamscape, you know, they just like drop in, and then something else will drop in and drop in, and it's, yeah, it's quite amazing how effortless life can be, and I mean life in, under the guidance of, of the Spirit. Because even guided experiences are still mostly perceptual. There are these revelatory experiences that can come in that transcend perception entirely, but most of them are, are perceptual. And the, the greatest quality I've found with the miracle is the sense of ease. 
it's the sense of being done through, or some things seem to be happening, but you don't have an investment in them, you're, you don't feel like you have a personal effort, you're not trying to control them in any way, you're delighted by them, but you have no control over them, and sometimes they can come, and they can seem to go or reconfigure in different constellations, but the trust grows very strong so that you can have a steadiness of just beholding them without, how do I keep them, or how do I bring them back, or how do I control them? There isn't that element of trying to control the world. And that's where the lightheartedness comes in, when you realize you can't control the world, but you can train your mind to see the world in a different way. So it's like Jesus says, like Rumi says, a lot of mystics say, it's not it's not so much what you see, but it's how you see it. It's not so much even what you feel, but it's how you feel it. The how starts to become the Holy Spirit. The how becomes the miracle. The how becomes forgiveness. An amazing thing that our how, instead of being some kind of a formula or some kind of doing in form, becomes a way of looking. How do I want to see the world? Is so important. And then we we cease to have to answer all these questions, ask these questions of why. Why did that happen? Why did this happen? You know, you hear the analytical ego trying to rush in there with, but why did this happen? And why did they say this? And why did they do this? And what a distraction to look at the timeline, or even look back on history with all of the, the whys trying to piece it together in some kind of a, a linear way that's supposed to have meaning, and yet I have found, even with a, a five-year degree in urban planning and all kinds of things where I really was trained to see the world in a very linear way, that at some point I intuitively got that I had to let go of that way of perceiving to be consistently happy. I had to be more trusting, I had to learn to, to let go and just behold things, let things be given to me, show up in my life, but not the sense that David had to control it, David had to make, make things happen. And so, what a ride! What a ride with the Course! I was thinking, this is like, this is year 33 for me with the Course, and what a ride it's been these decades. It's just been like, whoa, you know, I was talking down in San Diego and I was saying, wow, if I go back and try to look at my work with the Course in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s and the now the 2000 teens, I'm just going to have to break, break that parable up into Star Trek episodes, <laughs> you know. Yes. But what, what about those revelatory experiences? Oh, that was the original days of Kirk and Spock. That was, that was the 1980s, off in a hermitage in northern Kentucky, and doing eye-gazing, and, and having the figure ground collapse, and going off into these revelatory experiences. And then the 1990s, that's the next generation of, you know, of going around the United States and Canada doing these hundreds and hundreds of gatherings where I just show up, keep showing up, show up again at a course group, another course group, show up at a Unity Church, show up at Religious Science, show up at a barbecue, family reunion. I mean, I think I was over in Barcelona one time and... Uh, you know, they were like, we hear you, you like to do movies and everything, and, and uh, but the, the husband was hosting me and the wife was doing an art exhibit in the house. So they brought a TV out into the backyard and then we all huddled together and I did a movie gathering outside, an outdoor movie gathering with this group of people. But you just start to be like water, you just flow with, okay, it's all perfect, what's given? And uh, one time I was in Hawaii and I, I was talking about this mystical little movie we had made called Time's End. Um, and uh, it's referred to in the, uh, 
in the book Quantum Forgiveness, Physics Meet Jesus, but I was at the end of this table and I kept talking about this movie and everybody at the table was kind of like, oh my gosh, we, that sounds amazing. We would love to see this little mini movie you made called Time's End because it was all about everything's a present choice and there's no guilt uh, in the present if you fully go into it. And then I took out my iPhone and I just said, oh, I've got it here. And so I held it at the end of the, the table and we all watched it. We did a movie gathering at on this like, picnic table and pause it. Ooh, what is, ah! <laughs> now we're going into it. Zooming into the present moment with this little iPhone. Um, this was the size. So this is the size of the screen that you had uh, at the end of the table. But the Spirit just gives you whatever you need to dip down into that moment. And will provide you with whatever you need. Whatever it is, the, the means will be given for you to dive down into that moment. And that's very comforting to think about. That it's just going to be given. It's just going to be given. And it also does the, the Course is a pathway in bringing the darkness to the light, bringing the illusions to the truth. So, for me, it was like, from the beginning, I could see like, whoa, this self-concept of, of the world, linear world and David, that's going bye-bye. Like they say in the Matrix, Kansas is going bye-bye. Uh, this self-concept that I thought was me is going bye-bye fast. So these 33 years have been a lot of rinsing of that. Um, and it started back in the late 20s when, when most people are building a career and building a self-concept. I was just rolling off of 10 years of university full time and then Jesus just snatched my mind um, back towards light and truth after that. So I spent the first 28 years kind of trying to build, build, build my carve out my niche and build my identity. And then when I was 28 years old, 27, 28, it just did a 360 reverse. So it's almost like uh, having like a giant vacuum cleaner just start to suck <laughs> all the concepts out of your mind that you use for all the building. Just, just vacuuming in there. It's strong and just, and yet, I seemed to be used to travel, to speak, there were so many miracles, there was just amazing experiences were happening, but they were all for laying aside the self-concept, they were not for building a concept, it was all for letting it go. And to me that's why it's been so light and joyful, I think, is because I could, I surrendered to the movement of the dismantling the movement of the unlearning, the movement of the undoing, I surrendered to that instead of fighting and kicking and screaming against it, I actually yielded into it. And that, to me, that's like the road less traveled. That has made all the difference. That yielding into the, the experience of healing instead of fighting it. And I think that's the way it goes for us when we do resist um, that's where we bring the most difficult experiences. It's the most intense in our mind when we're resisting that gentle movement back towards the Christ, towards love and light. And so I, I really have, you talk about, uh, are you in the resistance? No, <laughs> I'm letting go of the resistance. <laughs> now in the political terms, it, uh, are you with the establishment or are you with the resistance? <laughs> Well, neither of them sound good. <laughs> I, I can't say I'm with the establishment, and I'm definitely not into resistance. So, I'm into like the let go, just to let go, be carried. So, yeah, maybe we'll just start again. I love these gatherings to be very, very interactive with what's going on in your awareness, or questions, or experiences you're having, and if you are wondering how they kind of fit into this awakening and into this healing, and just take some time periodically to just 
open it up to see if anybody has anything that they'd like to explore together or discover. I uh, wanted to uh, let go of something and the way you said it was the essence of what I was missing and it's it just I'm so grateful. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm glad. Yeah, it's there's just one of us here, so the spirit is <laughs> no, is blessing us. You've done the work, and I know <laughs> it because it was just the way you said it, mm. and it was. Oh. I'm done. Mm. I'm done with that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah, as a course student, um, I've been uh, forgiving more and more. But I found some interesting things that have coincided with that. One, a markedly less amount of fear in my life to the point where I think some neuroplasticity mm -hmm. is going on because it, it, it's getting harder and harder to experience fear you know, <laughs> at a fundamental level. So, that's the good news. Uh, interesting side effect too is, is I've found that the weight of gravity that I experience is much more intense. Now you'd think that would be counterintuitive. The more I head to the light, the more dreamy life would be, and you know, the easier things from a physical standpoint uh, should be, but not with me. I find that it is more of a struggle to go to the grocery store, for example. It's more of a struggle to walk out to my car, get in the car, drive to the grocery store, find a parking place, get out. Fortunately, they have those shopping carts that can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and they come home. Uh, but here is an odd thing. Along with that, quote, heaviness, unquote, is a, I guess, an energy field I bring with me where they're just it becomes a friendly experience. Practically everybody I bump into the store is friendly. The checkout people, I think they're so used to being taken for granted that if I just start a conversation with them, you know, a banner, they're really appreciative. And so, so it's strange in that it's a physically heavy experience. I'm giving that as an example. Yeah, it's a emotionally uplifting experience. So I'm going, well, where the hell is this leading? You know, are they going to have to take me up to the store in a stretcher? <laughs> okay, point to what you want from the shelf, Paul, and I'll get it for you. But, you know, see what I mean? It's, yeah. Yeah. I, I can't say I feel bad about it. I can't feel I feel good about it. It is irritating. The heavy aspects are irritating. You know, if I, if I let them be irritating, they're not irritating now because I'm putting them within a positive overall concept, which is consistent with the truth that you've been expressing. But I, have you encountered anybody else that has had this, that's had to deal with this, how shall we say, a force multiplied sense of gravity? Yeah, I actually, that, I can relate to that in the sense that it's like when you're, when you're moving, you're opening to the miracle, um, there can be some things that there's still a little bit of undercurrent of, of heaviness or fear with. It's like, a, like an echo that's still there from the ego. And then you start to have these show me experiences, like you, you, they're uplifting. Uh, that was my experience when I started traveling. It wasn't something that I had just visualized as a child or, or as a teenager, can't wait to travel and travel and get out there. It was a bit of trepidation at the beginning, like, that's not exactly my com comfort zone, but yet there were these miracles, these uplifting miracles that were coming in so strong. And I think that is part of that, you have that willingness to say, I'm willing to, I don't know where this is going, but I'm willing to, to, feel that open-heartedness, I'm willing to see those witnesses of joy, of lightness, of friendliness. Also I find nowadays with, um, 
it doesn't, it's not specifically technology, but technology can be used by the spirit in kind of very convincing ways. Like a friend of mine was born in, Francis was born in Beijing, China, and um, we took, I think we had maybe like six different trips over to China, and um, in one of the more recent ones, uh, we were all, we were just amazed at the technology. It was almost like they had taken apps, like the, like the apps in the Western world, you know, the, the PayPals and the Facebooks and all the different, and put them all into one app. Like all the best apps were all just one app. And then this one app was just extraordinary. You could chat on it, you could buy lunch with it, you could <laughs> order uh, something that you wouldn't think you could order on an app with it. You could do just about anything. And uh, Frances, she went off to visit her mother, I think, in Beijing. And before I got to China, she went to visit her mother, and she was with her mother, and she's like, hadn't seen her mother in years. She said, Mom, why do you keep the house so cold? It's This house is freezing. This house is so cold. And her mother picks up her phone, and she goes like this. And, and then 10 minutes later, ding dong, the doorbell. There's a heater being delivered, <laughs> and, and Francis is like, "Mom, what's going on here?" And she said, "Oh, yeah, this, we need anything. We do it on on our app anymore. It's called WeChat. It, it just did just about anything you can imagine an app could do. It could do. They even had they had their own monetary system and credits, and it's all paid for. And there's a, a heater. And Francis is like, "Wow, that's kind of cool." We experienced that. I mean, I went to, to Japan too, and it, they've got WeChat over in Japan. And I'm meeting with these people that are just amazing individuals and everything. And at the end, um, they, they were like, uh, oh, David, you have uh, WeChat. And I said, yeah, I, I got it installed. And so instead of going around getting people's phone numbers and names, everybody's pushing their phones near each other. The little app, it's all transferring. And I used to think hugging and talking. And, Did you get her number? Did you get his number? You know, that was like the, well, that was like, what century is that in here? Like, and then I remember in Japan, they're just, choo, 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 and, I'm, and I'm like, whoa, I am in a different realm. But see, I like that. I like, because anything that is simple and easy, like when you're talking about your situation, it reminds me, uh, I go into, where were we in Sam's shopping a, couple, a week or two ago or whatever, and they're like, I'm looking over the board, and they say, yeah, just, just go online and order in advance or call it in, and they go through and they shop for you and they got it all for you and you show up. And there it is, it's all ready to go out <laughs> to your car. Well, that will take away your, your yeah. shopping thing. And then you go in there and do a little Apple Pay. <laughs> it's like, ah! <laughs> it's like, you hardly have to move a, move a finger, <laughs> you know, and it's done. And to me, those are just symbols using technology of, those are time savers. And, um, and I do feel like that they are reflections of the miracle in the sense that that's the whole point of the miracle, is to save us time, to save us struggle, to save us difficulty, to, to show us that life can be easy. Life as, as our Creator created us is easy, so we can even have a reflection of that divinity on earth. It's called a happy dream. Well, who, what course student doesn't like the phrase happy dream? You know, you put those two words together, <laughs> happy dream. It's a little different than what I read this morning about your, today we celebrate the end of your dream of disaster. <laughs> you know, let's go from that dream of disaster, which is egoic, into the happy dream. And then as we even have a curiosity, like, Sounds, tell me more about this happy dream. What is the happy dream? What is the holy relationship? It's a dream of non-judgment. It's a 
relationship of non-judgment. That's what the happy dream and the holy relationship are about. Judge not, lest you be judged. It's, it's again, judge not. It's back to those two words that Jesus was speaking 2,000 years ago. To me, what I've discovered is the way to get to that judge not, the practical way to move into this realm of no judgment, is through guidance. And so, when I read the Course, I really, my eyes were popping open, I was so alert and attentive any time there was any talk of guidance. Because, you know, growing up even in a Christian home, it, it was not a topic, you know. We would pray over the food, we would pray for our cousins to have a safe trip, and we'd pray for these world events and everything, but there was no topic of guidance, you know. Go to school, get a good education, don't talk back to your parents, do your homework, do your lessons, do your responsibilities. There wasn't a shred of talk about guidance. Well, a lot of times the Ten Commandments is all there is, all we get. Yeah. And then the, the, the fine nuances and all that, we got to figure out ourselves. Right, on the day to day. Or stay confused. Yeah, the Ten Commandments, like, that, that's cool, they sound pretty cool. Now, on the day to day experience, it's like, Listen, ask that in Sunday school. Don't don't bring that up at the breakfast table. That's off limits, you know. So for me, when I got into the course, I I was really keen to tune into guidance. And for at first it was it wasn't words or anything. It was just little signs and symbols, little nudges, little little feelings here and there, like, I'm drawn to this, and this resonates with me, and that, that doesn't feel good at all, you know, just tuning into that. That's a big step, just to do that. That's a huge step. And then, as most of you know the story, I, I used the Course as an oracle, so I would pray, and then formulate a question, pop it open, and I'd get so excited with what I would see, that I would read until my eyes would get heavy, then I'd do it again, and this would go on for about eight hours a day. And that helped start to connect me more to the guidance. To the point where I, I could, like Helen Shuckman, I could, Jesus speaking to me in my mind in a conversational tone, what to do, where to go, who to see, who to call, everything. What do I do about this? What do, how do I handle this? Going off to to visit course teachers, spending hours and hours up with in Roscoe, New York, with Ken and Gloria and Rosemary and all the t wonderful people over there, the translators, and then going to these workshops, gatherings, and Jesus was doing commentary in my mind, always commenting on the teachings, pointing things out. Pay attention here. Look at this. Here's an example for this, you know, it was, it was a conversational connection with Jesus. And that, to me, was the most important thing. If we were talking in Star Trek terms, that's the original edition. That's, that was the making contact, you know, Scotty beamed me up. That was the, the mystical experiences and making that strong connection with spirit that is so essential with guidance. Because if we don't have that connection, then we're basically using our past learning and trying to navigate time and space the, base, the best that we can, based on our education and our programming and conditioning. And that's pretty much the school of hard knocks. You know, for most of us, <laughs> the past is not the best teacher and advisor. You know, we, we, we run into a lot of obstacles, and those are forgiveness opportunities. So I'm glad you brought that up because I actually feel what you're describing in some way, maybe whether it's either experienced physically or even mentally, there can be uh, very often, as you start to give yourself over to the mind training, you can feel sluggish, you can feel a bit heavy. Uh, things can feel a bit like you're out of your comfort zone. And, and I feel like that, in my experience, that's very, very common. That yeah, well, it's gotten to the point now, we're just going out for walks is a challenge, so I'm thinking, well, I'll, I'll get a treadmill, 
put it in my studio and just put my hands, you know, on the on the rail and do my walks that way. Yeah. yeah. See, so yeah. I, I I don't know. It's yeah. I just haven't heard any course students talk about. It, so it was one of yeah. I thought it might be kind of a, a new thing to bring up. Yeah, I think I think that's the thing of of yeah. Don't don't try to stretch it or push it or whatever. I mean, that may seem like a rare thing, but like uh, Sava and I are talking about that. A lot of times, she just even the last few days, you felt real dizzy, mm. like very dizzy. And then when she starts receiving these songs from Jesus, the songs and the lyrics and the music and the instruments and all these things, there's been times where she's just so given over to Jesus that that her body just moves so slow. Like I'll see her like walking just this Oh, it's coming toward me from the other side of the house, and just like like in super, super slow motion. Like it's difficult sometimes to walk. And I've had people over the years. Um, who one time my friend Kirsten, she she was at this we had this Course in Miracles monastery in Utah, and she was there, and we were having a session in the main house, and then and as I was talking, I kind of looked over at her. And then she had this hot cup of coffee, and she went right into a very deep mystical experience with this uh, hot cup of coffee. And it just was moving really slow over there, and I was still talking, and then someone who was next to her saw that she was going into a mystical experience with this hot cup of coffee, and then kind of got the coffee <laughs> from her. Uh, I had another friend uh, in Colorado named Lynn, we know Lynn Corona, and she told me one time she was down near the Garden of the Gods, and she was coming up. I think is it was it Highway Twenty Twenty Five, the one that comes up, and she was going along, and then she went into a mystical experience, and to her surprise, she came out like I think it was like five miles down the road, still driving the car, <laughs> and she was like. Okay, because I mean, you know, that wasn't her preconception. Is the preconception would have been, it's not good to have a mystical experience when you're on the highway going 60 miles an hour, uh, because your spiritual path and may converge with your survival <laughs> instinct in some way. But that was kind of a, a, a for her it was a big thing. Wow, like that's taken care of. Like I don't know how that happened, but she was way down, miles down. And and another time we were Regina Don Akers and I were having lunch with Kirsten and we were all just having a chat at lunch and she had a sandwich up. It started to go up towards her mouth and then all of a sudden Kirsten dropped into this very deep mystical experience and her eyes got real big and she <laughs> we were just talking, she was like looking at the sandwich. Like, like she'd never ever seen a sandwich before, you know, and had no awareness of what a sandwich was, or what lips were, or a mouth, and chewing, and so she just was like this, and we both kind of looked over, continued talking, and then we saw her, and she slowly like, tried to bring it down. But that's just, those are like symbols that this, the state of mind, of this unity, this love, this oneness, it's so far beyond what human beings can conceive of, and yet it's always there for us. It's, it's there, it's, it's who we are. And these experiences come in, and I find with such, such care, even with, you know, laying aside the body in such a graceful, graceful way, you know, to me is, is such a heartwarming experience, that we're so loved and cared for. Because that's the one thing we really need to keep in mind while we're going through this kind of sometimes uncomfortable process is how cared for we are, how nothing's happening at random, nothing's happening by accident, and we are perfectly cared for. We were just uh, visiting with Gia and Gia was sharing an experience that she had where she had an experience where you just were laid out and 
in a tent. It wasn't even your own tent, but <laughs> Spirit found a tent to, to park you in when you went through this big let go mystical experience that went on for hours and hours and hours. And I just love hearing those witnesses because all of us need to hear that message that, that we are cared for through this transition. It's very important for us all. So thank you for sharing that. That's glad to be here and share it. <laughs> We're glad you did too. Yeah. Yeah. I think miracles really convince us. Like I know I mean the course of miracles came into my life when I was in just in so much after ten years of university full time, so it was like a big change of gears for me, but but I have to say that it's like it's like our mind is saying, Okay, I'm willing, but convince me, show me. And and even when people would call me up and tell me these difficult <coughs> situations or why why is the spirit not doing this and why am I not being helped and doesn't God doesn't even care about me? And I would just say I said, well, what I got from reading the Course is that all I have to have is just this little willingness and the Holy Spirit is basically, it's all on the Holy Spirit. So I, I learned to just put it all on the Holy Spirit. You know, I would, I would have resistance and I would say, well, it's your job to convince me, so come on, bring it on. And then boom, you know, <laughs> I, got, I had so many experiences by throwing it all on the Holy Spirit by not trying to think that I personally had to do a lot of things. I just had to be like, willing for that tweak in the mind to, to see things differently, to be shown. And then it turned into like a big adventure, you know. Here we're going traveling and you're going to do this and this and all these things started coming in. Um, kind of like that that old TV show, now it's it's made into a Tom Cruise movie series called Mission Impossible. <laughs> you know, I can help you. Um, in 30 seconds this tape will destruct. Here are your instructions. Uh, and then and then the instructions, you listen to them, and then pssst, and And here comes the smoke. And that's the way I started getting, I would get these downloads from Spirit, like, here's what you're going to do. And, ooh, ooh, ooh. And then, and then, this, oh, oh, okay, now here we go. It, I had to go from a fear mode into, that's an adventure. I mean, I started to just see everything, those instructions, and then, okay, that's an adventure. I started seeing everything as an adventure, instead of like, how am I going to do that, or, oh my God, I don't think I can do that, or, you know, all the fears and doubts and coulda, woulda, shouldas, I said, no, I, it's more helpful for me to see it as an adventure. Like, I'm being taken on an adventure. I'm going to go with it. I'm going to be a willing participant in this adventure. There's even game shows on TV, you know, where the participants come on in, and they really have to be in an adventurous state of mind. Otherwise, they're going to look like a fool <laughs> and be totally humiliated. <laughs> if they're frozen in fear, we know how that goes on the game show. <laughs> the contestant that's frozen in fear, you know, it, it doesn't go well. But So, I found the more I went into that sense of adventure with it, I went way beyond my perceived comfort zones, but I, I started to get more relaxed and more confident I started feeling more trusting, and I started to really believe Jesus when He said, If you will be a miracle worker for Me, I will arrange time and space for you. That sounded like a pretty good deal. Yeah. Miracle worker, yes, and you arrange time and space. Nobody told us. Mom and Dad did not tell me. No one. <laughs> history professors didn't tell me. Chemistry pro no, prof Nobody was telling me that that Jesus would arrange time and space, and yet I had to get into that actual experience of that's, hmm, it actually seems that way. Mm -hmm. From Specifically from travels in the early years, you know, when I was out on the road and 
things would just show up and materialize and it happened again and again. Then I'd get into tightness or freeze in fear and then I'd hear, you know, I am taking care of you now. You can let go of that 10 years of university and all that programming. I'm in charge. I'll take care of you. But where am I going to sleep? I'll arrange that. But what if I run out of gas? I'll arrange the gas. You know, I, I'm in charge here. I will arrange time and space for you. And then all of these, they're called out of pattern experiences started happening where you know, one time I, I went to a church and they asked me to give a talk and I spoke up and gave a talk and they said come back in the afternoon and do a workshop. And during the morning, it was before the church service, they had a Course in Miracles group. And you know like stand-up comedians have hecklers? I remember this particular day, I couldn't say two words. There was some guy there and he was, I'd say, then he'd come in. Say another word. Another word. So, okay. And then I went, did the afternoon workshop, and he showed up at the workshop, and I was just like, okay. But as the workshop went along in the afternoon, he was tuning in and listening, and then we took a break. He went home and he got his family. He brought his whole family. So he went from heckler in the morning to listener in the early afternoon brings his whole family during the break, and then by the time we're having dinner and, and afterwards I'm getting ready to go, and he says, how can I help you? Is there anything I can do for you? And, you know, you travel around, and, and I, I said, no, I can't really think of anything. He says, what about your car? Does it have gas in it? And I said, well, we can go check. And I looked, and it was down there empty. He said, I'll follow you to the gas station and I'll fill your tank of gas. So he went from heckler in the morning to filling the tank of gas in the evening. These are the kind of out of pattern experiences I'm talking about. We're all raised as human beings to, you know, it's to look out for the world, the world's hostile, it's the world is scarcity, the world's an uphill climb, it's a struggle, and all these beliefs, that's just, we're taught, that's just the way the world is. And then as we start to practice, have that willingness and practice, and we open up and we open up, then we start to have these out of pattern experiences that come in, that start to convince us that the world isn't what we thought it was. And Jesus says in the Course, the world was made in hatred. So that gives us a baseline. Okay, it's made wasn't created by God, it was made in hatred, and now it can be reinterpreted by the Holy Spirit. But it will take experiences, you know, to end our fear, experiences to end our experiences of guilt and doubt. We, we need mind-opening, heart-opening experiences. And then, like as the parable of David went on, there were just people showing up, people collaborating, we, you know, having lunch with Judy, you know, that she, you know, when I just listened to her tell of all the miracles and everything, um, starting that nonprofit. I mean, I even, she was telling stories of, some of you know that there was an article published right after The Course in Miracles just came out and was published. It was published in New Realities magazine, and the, the offer came, it was actually a, a, a magazine, it was like Psychic Magazine, it was a magazine about different psychic, name. different name, and yeah. about mediumship and different things like this, and then Helen said, no, we're not putting A Course in Miracles into a, a psychic magazine. <laughs> absolutely not. She absolutely refused to do it. And then um, the publisher, Jim Bolin, you know, was well, let's see, and then the Bill came in with it, yeah, and said, no, new reality, he said, that would work. So, okay, change the name of the magazine, and you'll let me print the article about A Course in Miracles. <laughs> yep, that's how it works, you know. <laughs> so, 
you know, but even for Jim Bolin, it took a lot to change the name of the publication, you know. And, and for Helen, that took a lot to, to say, go ahead, all right, go ahead and do it. And yet that, that kind of splashed the course out, you know, into the mainstream a little bit. It was, I think Judy said, maybe 50,000 circulation. It wasn't like a huge uh, magazine. I uh, found out about it in 1978, and it was in Psychology Today, and I ordered it then. Nice. That's, that's a much bigger method, a bigger circulation than Psychology Today, yeah. So I'm glad you did, that they did say to go ahead and do that. Yeah. And my children uh, would say to me, Mom, when are you going to be done with that book? <laughs> I'd say, never. Yeah. yeah, I have I have fun experiences with with a lot of mothers who have children that are reading my books or watching videos, because uh, sometimes the mothers watching these hours and hours of videos and the kids are going, it's David Hoffmeister again, <laughs> always David Hoffmeister on the screen, and this is sometimes it's a positive reaction, sometimes it's a negative reaction, like. Pay a little attention to us. Turn that guy off, and you know. But I, I love hearing all the experiences that people are having because everybody's coming across this in whatever way they do. Sometimes, well, you know, through. What I was wanting to let go of was that my daughter's been very resistant. But you started out the talk about how we've never been here, we never were here, and so I just all of a sudden realized. I don't have to worry about her. She's never even been here. Why should I be wanting her to read the Course in Miracles? She must do this. And thank you. Because, you know, you just want everybody to do it, and it just doesn't work that way. Why? They weren't even here. We're in heaven, asleep. Yeah. Having the dream of exile. That's it. Thank you for that. Because that, that is the grace. What you just described, that's where the grace, the ease comes in. But as soon as we try to see spiritual awakening in terms of persons, mm -hmm. it's sticky. You know, they should do this or they should do more of that, and and you can have guidance. Um, you can. We were just hearing Judy talk about her daughter. You know, where as far as a partner, and you know, her daughter's the co-president of the Foundation for Inner Peace of the publishers and this and this, and her her daughter saying to her boyfriend. I don't I hate to say this, but I really need a partner who's a Course in Miracles student. It's just too much to be doing all this and be the, you know. And he, okay, I'll do it, you know. And that's those are the miracles. Sometimes uh, the spirit does give you what you seem to need that that would help you. I think we're about, yeah, we're about to the time. So Sundari, do you want to lead us into uh, our little? Refreshment, a bathroom break here, and maybe you have some some instructions for people. You, you meant just to tell them about the logistics, right? Well, yeah, it's, yeah. it's two thirty okay. now, so we'll do so, that. So, you know, I've been sitting here just thinking about Jesus arranging time and space, and I must say, this has been just a, a, a kind of strange experience of time and space. Every time David's been here, my house has changed, and I've seen it differently. And like tables become chairs. I mean, it, 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 that's, yeah, that's a good thing. Right? You know, window sills become chairs. I've never had people sit on the bench before. Magically, Eric up there has arranged a streaming space with my couches like I've never seen them before. And um, I have two, I'm, I'm sort of. Um, interacting with two concussions that happened to me. And it's such, I, I mean, it was just like, it was a strange streaming of people coming in. And it was, you know, just really adjusting to a different time and space and seeing, anyway, it's wonderful. And so all the food has gone to a different space. Since <laughs> the table you know, has become a chair. And with, with, with the phone and way you turn it off and on is you grab for the string that isn't there and it goes on 
and you grab the string that isn't there and it goes <coughs> off, which is in case you just want to really understand that we're not here. <laughs> <laughs> Imaginary <laughs> string. And it's true, right? Yeah. All it says is just grab the string that's not there yeah. and it works perfectly. <laughs> so the food that used to be there always is, you know, always, and has gone to kind of that area and that area, and if you look around, there's napkins and plates, and enjoy yourself. And, um, <coughs> you know, and if you are going out, there's probably even more, like loaves and fishes. <laughs> 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 even even <laughs> fishes, I suppose. <laughs> so, um, so, again, this down is a little funky, but if you, just, if, you put, if you just hold it down, if you wouldn't believe what I actually do, when I do that, I hold it down, and I use the magnetism of my hand. And, you know, I seriously do this. <laughs> you know, what I find is that I keep holding it down, and I go like that. It always works for me. <laughs> Um, the heating systems, there's two heating systems the other bathroom's up there to the right, and enjoy the break. There seems to be a chair there, and whoever has stuck on these two chairs, I don't know, I know. And there seems to be one more chair up there.
spontaneous for me because I've listened to it now for a week and a half. It's now just, it just comes on and I'll just start to hear your songs in my head. And I'll just start singing. And you had the thought of this, of this song before the album yeah. even came out, but you're, you're pretty advanced. <laughs> you thought of it, it came out, and now it's, it's, doing, it's, it's doing its thing inside of me. Here, let me get in front of you because otherwise I'll.